Welcome to Both Sides TV. Super excited to have my most frequent returning guest to the show, John Frankel from FF Ventures. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Thank you. And, uh, and that's quite something because you're not even local. You're New York City. That's right. And you run a venture capital fund. You founded a venture capital fund in 2008. What, how did you have the idea to start a VC fund and why 2008? It was really a matter of just sort of uh, following a path that no one laid out for me. Mm -hmm. So when I stand back now, it looks incredibly logical. What were you doing in 2007? Like so, so I was at Goldman Sachs. I was there for 21 years. In 2007? In 2007, I was at Goldman, uh -huh. and I left in 08. And When in 08? Before Lehman, after Lehman? Isn't everything before, defined by before or after Lehman? Trust me, it was yeah. before Lehman. Yeah. It, was, it was February. I'm yeah. not sure I can remember the day, but it gotcha. was February 08. And I'd started angel investing in December 99. Okay. Um, obviously, I wish it was December 96, but it was December yeah. 99. And I, um, uh, I got to the point where I had sort of 20 angel investments under my belt. And I think a lot of angels reach that stage of saying, this is becoming overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So I either take it professionally or I stop doing this. Yeah. And you know, I left Goldman, I took six months to really think about what I wanted to do, yeah. and said, hey, let's go, and, let's go and take this for a ride. So I started. And, and your I, first fund was how big? Uh, Seven million dollars. Okay. Two months after Lehman blew up okay. was when we uh, And whose we had money was that? It was friends and family, a half okay. dozen people, actually a dozen people to whom I'm- Bunch of old Goldman Sachs people? Um, some, yeah. uh, some who were clients, some who were um, just folks I know, and they're okay. kind of like, look, take this money, don't lose it, <laughs> or if you lose it, don't yeah. tell me. Yeah. And sort of we hung up a shangle. Uh, shingle. And did I t did I t you lose the money? Or? No, the fund's actually top quarter performer for the year, uh, for the 08 uh, vintage, I guess. Um, but the, the thing that intrigued me was as I dug into the space, mm -hmm. I realized that there wasn't a ton of research but the research was there, that was there told me it was a really, really interesting space. And when you say research, you mean research about the venture capital industry? Re research about the angel investing space. So what okay. we've tried to do is take institutional quality process and procedures and apply them to the angel space, which, you know, angels by definition are part-time. Mm -hmm. so, uh, some are very professional in what they do, some are very amateur so what give they me an do, example but, they're good, of, but they're good returns in the space. Right, but what are the examples of institutional things that you did? Due diligence. Oh. <laughs> and more than just sort of reading the documents, yeah. but you know, really understanding the people who we were going to get into, you know, um, uh, effectively into bed with, mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that they were the type of people we wanted to trust our LPs money to, and making sure that um, they understood who we were and what we could bring to the table. From that first fund, did you mostly invest in New York City? or First fund was mainly New York. We had a couple of West Coast investments in that fund. Mm -hmm. uh, Cornerstone On Demand that went public in 2011. Um, we invested in uh, Indiegogo, world's largest crowdfunding campaign. So you were an investor in Indiegogo. How early was that investment relative to Indiegogo's funding? Uh, Danae, Slava, and two other people whose names escaped me. So there were four people in a room, crowdfunding wasn't a concept. Had they raised money from anyone else? No, I believe this was their first round. What, it, was what, it was led by Metamorphic and we joined the round. What was the concept that convinced you you should invest in Indiegogo? I really felt there was something about bringing people who were passionate about ideas and wanted to raise money, yeah. and people who had money and would be passionate about those ideas if only they could find them. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I don't know. convince you this was the right team to do that? Because this concept isn't new. We always bet on teams. Yeah. And we just felt Slava and Danae um, had the drive and the vision. They and, the, and the other two guys. And the, and the other two. <laughs> They were the two founders, yeah. um, but they, they had the drive to really want to make this work. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, the, it's the X factor that's tough to articulate. When you meet a founder, you go, that's someone right. I really want to back. And that's, you know, that's what the team was. And I don't know if you've followed recently, there's a campaign closing imminently for a beehive. 
a this, beehive. It's an, a couple like of people one of these in places Australia. Where you live in it? No, 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 no. A beehive a real beehive. that has honey. Okay. Right? And okay. rather than having to take out the combs and mm. smoke them, they came up with this device where you just wind a crank on the outside, it cracks open the honeycomb, and the honey pours out into jars. And you and I go, like, that's ridiculous. Yeah. They wanted to raise $70,000. You know yeah. how much they've raised so how far? Much? Almost $10 million. By largest, million. largest international crowdfunding campaign. Who would think for beehives? Yeah. And in what country do they smoke beehives? Like, that's the first ever. Maybe in Colorado oh. they do that? No, over, no you've got to get. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, it's not something that I've, it's not something I've that might participated be a in. So. <laughs> So, oh, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you saw this, but DCM just announced that they funded or the company announced that they raised money from DCM for an Uber delivery service for marijuana. Did you see that? I did see that. My, my, my chin hit the table. Uh, Why did it hit the table? Uh, well, so, I mean, I'll just say it publicly. I'm very pro-legalization. So right. not, it's not for any political reason. Uh, I've been talking a lot to Snoop Dogg's people about their interest in, in getting into the space. They obviously have the right brand affinity <laughs> uh, for legalization of marijuana, and, uh, and obviously it's legal in many states. Right. Uh, or at, at minimum in two, uh, mm -hmm. the two that are talked about the most. Um, but what surprised me is I didn't think institutions would yet put money in it. Why? Because most institutions, most venture capital funds who have to raise from LPs, our LP base are fairly conservative. I mean, VCs are conservative, but the LP base is very conservative. You know, the one thing they say LPs don't want is headline risk. Right. You know, a risk that somehow your name is, so let's say you're a state pension or you're a university endowment, and now you have to say, we invested in these guys who are investing in pot. That's headline risk. So I was surprised. I didn't think that any institutional fund would do it. I, I got to tell you, um, which, which, by the way, I'm not saying it's not a good investment. I just, oh, I thought I, people would be risk averse. I, I tell you the way I look at this. I also have sort of fairly libertarian views on this regard. Um, I think that it's not. I think it should be decriminalized. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a huge societal benefit to do that. Um, I think, you know, billions of dollars are going to be made in this space. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, they're going to be made without us. Yeah. Again, it's this conservative nature. Um, there's just certain things that... But were you surprised that a VC fund would have funded it? Do you think there's going to be a lot more? Are we all funding pot companies? I, 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 well, there will be a lot more pot companies funded. Mm -hmm. In three or four years, it will be seen as mainstream. Yeah. Um, but... Um, you think we'll have national legalization? I think we should. Yeah. Whether we will, we yeah. should. That's I mean, a matter of politics. The, the silly thing is, so I read the data that 70% of people, by the time they've graduated high school, have tried pot. Um, and a considerable number of people smoke on a regular basis. And my simpleton philosophy, which is also a libertarian philosophy, uh, for, aside from government shouldn't necessarily be involved in regulating what people do in every s spectrum, it's clear that you have, I mean, if you study economics, which I'm guessing you probably did go into Goldman Sachs at some point. Uh, never oh, never, ne did. never okay. studied economics, but I have an understanding. Of okay. It. <laughs> I mean, you basically have a demand curve. You have supply and demand. And on the demand curve, you have something called elasticity. And elasticity says if you raise price by X function, let's just call it a dollar, right. how much demand falls off. Right. And if a product is elastic, it means that raising price by a unit, you drop a huge amount of consumption. If something is inelastic, it means if you raise and raise and raise prices, demand doesn't really change. So inelastic products are things like gasoline. Right. You know, you could double the price of gasoline. You're going to have a drop off of consumption, but not at the same rate that you would expect if you double the price of, say, Coca-Cola. Right. Uh, turns out drugs are very inelastic because demand is high, right? Everybody wants drugs. I mean, people who want to but, consume but, them like alcohol. But you see, there's, again, I didn't study economics, so there's probably a third axis on that chart, which is regulation. And if you change the regulatory backdrop, mm -hmm. um, the, you probably find it moves from inelastic to elastic. It ceases, yeah. it, it, 
it ceases to be the forbidden fruit? You may have a different argument that you want to make, but that argument doesn't apply. So I apologize. But like, <laughs> but but so if your argument is, do less people want to consume it because it's not forbidden fruit? We could have that argument. Right. Um, but fundamentally, what I believe is that people who want to consume pot want to consume pot in the same way people want to consume well, alcohol. No, the, so the, here, here's the way the, to change. But there's it. a course. Hear, hear me out for yeah. one second. I, I want to tell you how to reduce the demand curve. Right. The way you do it is the same way we did it with cigarettes, which is you make it a stigma. And you not only make it a stigma, but you invest in education of the negative consequences of it. So you don't have to reduce consumption to zero, but you want to make people aware of the negative consequences and you want to put in place programs that can be funded through taxpayer dollars uh, to help people who want to get off of it. And we don't have any such programs or we don't have widespread programs because there's no tax dollars to do it. So if you made it legal, obviously you pull the money out of the criminal element of distribution. Right. Uh, you then can take those tax dollars and put those tax dollars into changing the demand curve. I, I agree with you, but here's a question. Mm. Why do you care about the, the volume of usage in the country? You Why care about care? dangerous usage. Sure. You shouldn't care about the volume of usage. If you're a libertarian view, right. you shouldn't care. Now, the research out there indicates that it's bad for people below the age of 25 sure. on brain formation and thought process and the like, uh, less effect uh, with older people. But, you know, fundamentally... So personally, I, as an individual, I don't care. Yeah. But as a society, I guess we probably would like to at least limit consumption. In the same way, I don't care if you drink... 18 beers in one sitting. Right. But as a general as rule. As long as you're not driving the car ahead of me, right? As a general rule, we can reduce consumption probably has a productivity gain overall on society. So there's probably negative externalities of people being alcoholics and living unhealthy lives or whatever. I mean, there are. There, right? no, no, listen, there are. But again, I think with education, mm -hmm. people should be free to choose. How the, how they I'm want not, to no, I, no, agree. I, could, I agree. I go tell you. But, but this is the point: is that if you have tax dollars that you can put into educating people and making people aware of the next er, negative externalities, it's like smoking. It's yeah. why cigarette smoking in the United States has come down through yeah. education. Yeah. And through people's awareness. Anyway, not to not to <laughs> we got, we got off topic, uh, but but I do think it's fascinating, well, and because, I do but, agree. But I want to take yeah. a parallel example yeah. here. Uh, California consumes a lot of water, yeah. and you have a highly regulated market here, yeah. and you have complete misallocation of resources right. because of the regulation. Mm -hmm. And I suspect if you change the regulatory parameters here, mm -hmm. the shortage would not be as severe. Mm -hmm. That um, very well maybe. You know, and but, so. But the, th but the same is true of of. I mean, it's it's across the country, right? Like if we look at why we produce so much corn in the country like you know i suspect that a third it, of it a third of it goes into ethanol right and it's not just ethanol but like we have farm subsidies and we have government programs that incentivize people to plant certain crop types that they may not plant if we didn't have government involvement yeah unfortunately that's the world we live in because to get elected as a politician you've got to please your constituency and your constituency you know, uh, the people who influence politicians are people who have money and people who don't want to see that money walk out the back door. So if we take uh, the, the big discussion in California is almonds yep. and uh, cattle. Right. Right. Because that's where a lot of water is going. I mean, I'm probably not disproportionate amount, but relative to the value of that crop. Um, but if you suddenly decided you were going to make it, it massively increase the cost for almond growers because they have to pay for the full value of that water, you're going to see one hell of a movement by people who make money out of growing almonds to stop the government from doing that. Exactly. So, but that's, that's the problem we face. Yeah, but almond prices over the years have collapsed and they've come very, very cheap because they've had uneconomical access to water. So you don't necessarily change I'm on your it over side. The, yeah, you I'm don't on your necessarily side. change. But I was just giving yeah. you an example of too much government interference in the marketplace. Yeah. So we're not disagreeing on anything. Let's uh, let's move along. <laughs> let's you, find something to it. disagree on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well we can disagree on lots, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm a little bit left on the spectrum than you. Uh, but so you raised a fund in two thousand eight, another fund in two thousand ten, and Correct. that was much bigger. Uh, that was a twenty seven million dollar fund. Fundamentally for our strategy, we felt 25 million was right-sized. Yeah. 
Um, in 08, it was tough to raise money. Yeah. Uh, 2010, we closed $27 million fund. It was right sized. And then with the money for our strategy, we learned mm -hmm. we didn't have enough money for our strategy. Okay. And so two years later, we raised our third fund, which was a $52 million fund. And that's, that's the right size for what we do. Okay. We like to stay in the early rounds. We think it's disingenuous to run a two or three hundred million dollar early stage fund and cut yeah. quarter million dollar checks. Right. They just Is don't move average, for funds. Average check size two hundred fifty. It's hundred to five hundred. Yeah. I mean, it, it really varies. Do you like to lead? Do you like to follow? Do you? We like to lead. Okay. Uh, we're one of the few early stage firms that likes to lead. Do you take board seats? We often take board seats. Okay. Uh, we have five partners, so we have a lot of capacity. What do you for think? Seats. There's so many fucking seed funds these days. What do you think makes a great seed investor? The, the simple answer is that you only know if you're a good investor when you retire. You need to be doing it. Know, you need to be doing it for twenty listen, years. So. But that's not the question I want to know. I want to know. I, I, I accept that answer. That's actually, I agree with that. But for a founder, how do I make sense out of all the people who oh, want to give me oh, it's money? So, it's very easy. I mean, is it just money now? Is it just like no. your Wells Fargo, well, or how should I? Well, about this. it can be. Yeah. So as a founder, you can say all money is equal. Yeah. Uh, and so let me take, if you class money on whatever scale, I'll take the simplest of money, the money with least involvement, least intellectual engagement and the like. We like to invest in companies where we can really help change the outcome. Mm -hmm. So we have 27 people, okay. which is about 22 more than the average fund our size. Yeah. Um, we put a lot of intellectual capital into our companies. We help them with recruiting, PR, accounting, How financial planning. How do you pay for all that? Um, we use cash. We find, you know, yeah. we find U.S. dollars is a yeah. good way to pay people. You're not, um, you're not paying in Bitcoin. Part, no, we don't. So pay how do you in afford to pay twenty-seven people? Partners take below-market salaries. Okay. Um, we pay all of our staff. Uh, their bonuses, in part, are in a derivative security that's tied to carried interest. So okay. every, everybody is in effect a partner in the business. And then we believe through various things that we do, we can generate you know, top quartile returns. And if you do that, um, the carried interest payout will be very nice for everybody involved. So we're long-term investors in our own business. But of the 27 people, like when you're a partner in a fund, uh, often you've made some amount of money. Right. So you can take delayed gratification. If you're a 24-year-old analyst at a fund, um, you know, the carried interest that you might get in 10 years. That's, time all, is I, that's all icing. Great for the future. I need to get paid. Yeah, today. no, no, no. That's, that's all icing. But we want, what we want to happen is if we have a big payday, if one of our companies does really well, mm -hmm. we want everybody to have a smile on their face that day. We okay. don't want just the, you know, four people sitting in a corner yeah. sort of, uh, you know, opening a bottle of champagne. Right. Right. We want this to be a shared experience amongst our team. We have, I mean, you know, we have a different approach than other firms. Um, that we don't have an open door policy because mm -hmm. no one has an office. Right. Um, partners and non-partners sit next to each other. We, um, there's, uh, most firms are, I, I don't use the term fiefdoms, but there's a partner and analyst associate, partner, analyst, associate, and that's mm -hmm. separate teams. Mm -hmm. We run as one team. Okay. And so our companies can talk to a half dozen people on any given month, any given week, helping them with different aspects. The partner doesn't act as a hub. And so, so it's, a diff it's a different approach. Got it. So back to I'm Joe Entrepreneur yep. or I'm Joanne Entrepreneur yep. and I'm looking to raise money and I've got five different seed funds I'm talking to. How should I make sense out of who I take money from? Well, firstly, do they have any conflicts? Mm -hmm. Are they investing in competitors for you? Mm -hmm. That's easy to work out. Secondly, where are they in the life of their fund? Are you mm -hmm. going to be the last investment in the fund and mm -hmm. therefore they can't follow on? Mm -hmm. What's their reputation? Mm -hmm. What's their reputation? And then the fifth point, what's their reputation? Right. So talk to founders of companies that succeeded. That like a very Rick Perry kind of answer. <laughs> no, he wouldn't have got to the third yeah, one. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the third one was... Yeah, it's uh, like location, location, location. He should have just repeated the second thing <laughs> and made it a third but, but that would have helped him. Yeah. But you know, let's, let's not go there. We'll get another chance, I think. Yeah. I think he's running again. Yeah, okay. But, help uh, us. <laughs> but um, 
it's reputation. It's talk to the people. You will spend more time yeah. so with I have, that team I have than a, anyone else. I have a piece of advice, and yeah. I want to test it out okay. uh, and see what you think of it. I always tell entrepreneurs, I, I agree with you, you know, reputation matters tremendously. And first of all, I would say 20% or fewer of entrepreneurs actually do reference checking on their VCs. We insist of, on it. Of, of any sort. 100% of us do. And what I always tell them is don't go on the either the intros, purely on the intros the VC gives you. Of course, like any reference check, they're going to give you their best references. Right. But also don't solely ask the people who did well. Oh no, you gotta ask the failures. You gotta ask the failures, because everyone loves their VC when they do well. Okay. But the question is, how did they treat you when things didn't go well? Did they roll up their sleeves? Were they helpful anyways? Did they help you resolve problems when you were absolutely in the shitter? Did they treat you with respect? Even sometimes like, you know, I've replaced CEOs and I still will offer them up as references and say like, they may not say everything great about me, but they will say that I worked my ass off in the toughest times, even when it meant we were changing CEOs. It's, it's so important. I mean, we encourage people to reference us through their own networks. Mm -hmm. We'll help give them intros if they want them. But you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you have to reference the people. But understand the marketplace. Mm -hmm. The marketplace is very momentum driven. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to be in the round because Mary's in the round and Joe's in the round and Pat's in the round. Right, they're sort of, and you get these party rounds where no one's leading it, mm -hmm. and the terms are whatever, and people sign it. And what what happens is the founder doesn't get. What do you see the downside get... of party rounds? Because you know we talk a lot about party rounds. Well, I, I think the downside is there's no one there helping the founder. Everyone's mm -hmm. relying on everyone else to have done the work, mm -hmm. but no one's sitting there guiding the founder, giving them feedback. Giving do you know what them it's advice. like? It's like a group email. If you send a group email to 10 people and you say, hey, can someone help me, right? right. In a way, it's like the, the tragedy of the commons or whatever. Like everyone else is assuming everyone else is responsible for helping you so no one does. Right. You know, and that's why I always tell people but, but, when you send emails for help, send 10 individual But, but it's, it's structural. And okay. it's, this isn't, you'll, you'll understand this, but I think most founders will find this educational. When you, start, when you start out with a firm, and yeah. there's three or four of you, and you, over time you build up to four or five people, and you're on your third fund, you've now made 40 investments. Sure. You don't have any bandwidth mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have bandwidth, and you know that your biggest winner is gonna be worth more than everyone else, yeah. and your second biggest worth more, the ones that are failing, you literally make an economic decision to not even return mm -hmm. email. Right. And we've seen this. We've seen great people with great reputation or great names suddenly run off the reservation when things get tough. Mm -hmm. They don't have the capacity, so they're much better to spend the 10% spare capacity on their winners. Mm -hmm. Our model, by having 27 people, we've tried to build the intellectual bandwidth to help deal with companies when they succeed and fail. We think we'll end up with less failures because we think we can help those companies um, deal with the speed bump they've hit. We hope to have stronger winners mm -hmm. and we hope to have better returns and better carried interest and that all feeds on itself. I mean, I will say, so I agree with you that there are some of the best brands out there do cut their losses and just move on on companies not performing well. It's an economic decision. But I will say that there are also fantastic firms where the partners just don't quit. And it's maybe not economic, but they either view it as both a commitment that they made, maybe to themselves oh, as the, the, the entrepreneur. The, the, no, no, I'm, just I don't like, just, I, I'm not saying they're bad. You'll find, you'll find out, I know, but you'll find out both on a firm by firm basis, because firms have cultures, but also on a partner by partner basis. I know some partnerships where I've seen the partner, no matter how much he knows this company's doing, will still put in the hours and roll up his or her sleeve. And I've seen other places where you can, at the same firm where they just, they're done. There's another, there's another thing you should watch out for, and this, this can apply more to Series A than Series C, which is, is this a firm where my only point of contact will be the partner? Mm -hmm. And because if that's your only connected tissue to that firm, and that person takes a sabbatical, retires, mm -hmm. whatever. You lose sponsorship. You lose sponsorship. 
And the reason you went with that firm in part was sponsorship. But truthfully, honestly, I think that's on the entrepreneur. And here's what that, I said. No, I, that's what, was, that's what the, the advice I, we're giving. I have never worked with a venture fund where the partner has said, oh, don't contact anyone else in my firm. I mean, usually they don't necessarily wake up every day and say, let me introduce you to 15 other members of my firm. Right. But I always tell people it's in your interest to get to know multiple people in that firm. First of all, if you ever do hit a bump in the road and that partner needs to go advocate for you, the more people who know you Absolutely. in a tough time are gonna say, you know what? I don't know, I'm not convinced for sure, but John's gonna make something out of this business. Let, you know. And so the broader support you have, the better, and there's no one better to do that than you, the human connection. It's much easier to say no to a spreadsheet. It's much harder to say no to an individual. And also getting to know the principals, getting to know the associates, getting to know the broader staff. Those people all have networks, they all have point of view, and they all have different amounts of time. You can often find an associate who has a lot more time than a partner sitting on 14 boards. No, and, and I think you're right. It's incumbent upon the entrepreneur to make sure that happens and to have multiple points of contact for all the reasons you laid out. Let's talk about a company that did well, but sh should have, or we, we you in particular, but we all would have hoped would have done better, which is cloud. Okay. okay. So Joe Fernandez. Yep. Um, you backed him pretty early. What round did you back uh, him? We backed him in Series A round. It took, we met him November, I might get the years wrong, but I think it was 2010. The round closed in April 2011. Was it? It, was, it, was, it took five months to close. How it was much, a tough round to get done. How much did he raise in that round? Uh, 1.57 million. And was that his first like big institutional round? That or? was his first round. First round, okay. And were you lead? He had taken a couple someone, of checks did before. Did someone else lead? No, we ended up leading the round. How did you meet Joe? Um, Michael Yavanditti, who um, is the CEO currently of um, Yieldmo. Yieldmo, one of our portfolio companies. Uh, he was the CEO of Quigo, which we had invest, I had invested in previously, uh, sold to AOO in 2007. Um, for $350 million? Or thereabouts. Okay. And um, Michael um, was running a company at the time called Tract that became I remember. Yildma. And Michael said, I've met this guy called Joe. I think this is an interesting opportunity. You should meet with him. Yeah. So I sat down with Joe. I met with him. Liked him a lot. And I called him up a week later and Joe goes, why are you calling me? I go, what do you mean why are you calling me? He goes, I was in New York marketing last week. Yours was the singularly worst meeting I had. I thought after that meeting, as I walked out the door, you're going to call up everyone in New York and say, don't give this guy money. <laughs> I said, no. I said, I think it's a great idea. I think there's huge opportunity. I think it's a tough problem you're trying to solve. I think we can help you. Um, and we carried on ideating and talking about how, it, and how, we ended up leading the round. How would you describe what Joe wanted to build at the moment that you wrote the check? So I think when we cut the first check into clout, the idea was that on the internet, it's very tough to know who someone else is. Mm -hmm. um, there's this great New Yorker cartoon from 97, 98, with two dogs and a keyboard in front mm -hmm. of them, and it goes on the internet, no one knows if you're a dog. Mm -hmm. And what clout, allows you to do and allowed you to do was to get a sense of whether this person was a real person or not. Get mm -hmm. a sense of whether they had a following or not, whether people cared about the content they produced or not. We were just at the beginning of content marketing and mm -hmm. people generating content. And Joe's idea was you could create like a credit score for the web. Mm -hmm. And so this, this idea you know, I felt that when you looked at the foundation of social, there was trust, identity, reputation, and influence. Mm -hmm. And if you could get a sense of two of them, mm -hmm. you could have had a good chance of capturing all four. And so as we ideated, we talked about how clout was a sense of influence. Mm -hmm. And if they could build an identity aspect to it, they could get the other pieces as well and build a very valuable sort of Switzerland piece. And the, and, what was doable back then when Facebook and Twitter and the other platforms were much more open was the ability to try and build that Switzerland. Mm 
Mm. Um, and that was the risk we were taking. And I think today, what you see with Meerkat and Twitter's uh, response with uh, Periscope and the like, and the fact that a lot of the new networks don't even have APIs, is the networks don't want to allow Switzerland to build up. They don't want people to build on the back of their networks. And I think that takes away from some of the innovation mm -hmm. and some of the opportunity set that, that's out there. I mean, the internet itself was built on open protocols. If we didn't have HTTP, if we didn't have FTP, right. there would be no internet today. So, I mean, it's a dangerous world that we're going back to. I mean, it's like almost trying to go back to AOL. Walled garden, you yeah. remember that Walled term? Walled garden, of course yep. I do. So, and it's not just happening at a corporate level mm -hmm. or network level. Countries want to do it as well. You know, uh, Twitter is seen as evil in mm -hmm. Turkey. Um, you know, it's very clear the Chinese um, uh, have very different views about what the internet should be. Mm -hmm. um, the Great Firewall of China. The Great Firewall of China. But, the Great Canon of China. But to to go back to clout, um, yeah. they eventually raised. 50 million bucks from Kleiner Perkins, something like that? Well, I mean, there was Kleiner, IVP, Vemrock, ourselves, Greycroft, uh, there were, and many other people who were involved in various uh, stages of funding of the company. But at one point, but they did like a breakout mega round. There was a breakout mega round that Kleiner led. Kleiner led, led the last two large rounds into the company. And what, what did they see that Clout could have become? Like what? Um, I, how had the vision changed? They obviously had to have had some amount of traction to, uh, to raise I, a check that big. I think, I think their sense was that people would care about their online footprint mm -hmm. to the extent that they want to maintain a profile online. And if you build up enough of those profiles, mm -hmm. that in and of itself becomes interesting because that Switzerland could then become an independent OAuth, where you okay. don't have to give people access to your Facebook um, social network or your Twitter network in order to validate you. They would just know that you've been validated by a third party. Okay. And what do you think went wrong? I mean, that was like someone writes a $50 million check. You know, the company sold for $200 million, so we should say that, to I'm, Lithium. I, Correct, and lithium is doing great. And, and I don't think we can claim that that's failure, but it's not what people had expected. No one writes a $50 million check to sell I, for 200 million. I, I, I gotta tell you that when we did the Series A round, that 1.57 million round, 80% of people I spoke to were just skeptical. Mm -hmm. And when we did the Series B, 80% of people I spoke to were skeptical. And I think that skepticism stayed all the way up. So there definitely were a group of people who felt that this had an opportunity to become something very big. I think that the lessons learned for entrepreneurs is very simple. If you plan to run a business, mm -hmm. you need to generate revenue. Mm -hmm. Until you generate revenue that covers your costs, you're living off the kindness of strangers. Mm -hmm. And as you raise capital at subsequent higher rounds, you are then forced into a decision that that next round has to be justified even higher, right? or you're going to do a down round, or the better option is generating revenue. Now, the funny thing about revenue, it's not a tap that you can just turn on. It takes about two years to build the internal infrastructure to be able to do it. For mm -hmm. some businesses, this wasn't relevant for cloud, but for some businesses, you can start off attracting the completely wrong customer. You have great metrics, you've got all these customers, we haven't got the paying customers. But you know, in the day, there, you know, we used to have a lot of discussion about the lean startup, the lean startup. No yeah. one talks about the lean startup now. Everyone wants the fat startup. Everyone wants, give me the money. I want to raise as much as I can. But isn't there some lesson to be learned here, which is Clout was in the product market fit discovery phase of their business. Had they raised smaller amounts of money, they probably could have exper experimented more. They probably could have not had to chase the, I want to offer free offers on Virgin America and free trips to the Sands Hotel or whatever kind of sh schlocky you know, revenue streams they were chasing. And also not set the market expectations so high about what they were going to accomplish. And had they gone for a more pragmatic, slow approach, because I feel like the $50 million round is when you really have proven your business. So, so the, answer, the answer is maybe. But I'll tell you this, 
When Clout sold to Lithium, mm -hmm. how many salespeople do you think they had? Clout? Yeah. Five? Not even. Okay. They should have had 20. That's the problem. They're underinvested in See, revenue. I don't I actually don't agree with that. Now you're an insider, I'm an outsider, so you know, I'll take your word for it. But my feeling is <clears throat> they never quite figured out how that the, the product was never really quite ready for prime time. I feel like they solved a lot of problems. They solved problems other people hadn't. It was like cloud and peer index, and they were both making a lot of progress. But I feel like two or three more years on that journey, that slow going, evolve the product, figure out what our right niche is before putting too much rocket fuel in the rocket would have served Cloud well. And these things are great to look at in hindsight. Well, I, no, 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 I they, only say it because yeah. if people are faced with that situation... It's, 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 it's a delicate decision that you always have. Do you raise as and, much and money as you can just because you can? So, we still believe in the lean startup. Mm -hmm. We believe that it takes a company a couple of years to work out what they want to do. Um, we think that if you raise more money, you'll spend it. Mm -hmm. If you raise the money and you can extend the runway, that is a better outcome. But if you're going to have a three-year runway, why raise so much money in the first place? Um, so there's an iterative approach here. We think testing revenue early mm -hmm. is really important in business model. We've seen businesses have gone four, no argument. They've gone four years without yeah. testing yeah. revenue, yeah. and when they test it, it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. I wrote a blog post called "Ring the Fucking Cash Register." You know, I'm a yeah. big believer in and, it for all the reasons you espouse, but that's very and, different and than and raise fifty but, million dollars. But it's not just that revenue is your cheapest form of capital. Mm -hmm. It's the revenue has information. It's validating. It's information. You yeah. find out what people want to pay no for. No question. And you do more of that. Yeah. In fact, what they don't want to pay for, and you do less of that. Yeah, no question. And, and there is some argument for delayed revenue in certain types of business. But I usually say, for me, that's when you have extreme breakouts, something with extreme scale overnight. So let's say it was Snapchat that just took right. off you know, to an extreme level. So clearly achieved product market fit, and as a result of that, could raise almost limitless, limitless amounts of money. And in those very rare cases, I actually think slowing down uh, revenue expectations and raising a lot of capital makes sense. But it's a very rare company that it's it's a rare company, it's a rare occurrence. But everybody thinks it's how they should run their business. And, yeah. Yeah. Ultimately. It's important people understand that cash is what makes payroll. It's also a lesson for seed investors because, you know, to some extent, I remember not just clout, but if I take another example, fab. Right. You know, the nice thing for a seed investor, let's say you invest at a four or five, six pre. Yeah. And then someone wants to offer you 50 million at 250. Right. Suddenly, I now, you know, what VCs do, as you know, we do mark to market. So we take our position and we say, oh, well, I invested $500,000 at a $5 million valuation. That's now worth $250 million. So I then, on paper, am worth a lot more, just like the founder's worth more. Right. And I can use that to go tell LPs what a great investor I am and raise the next fund. But the danger of that is you pretty much are ceding control. Because if someone's writing a $50 million check into your company, the amount of leverage that you, and I'm not talking about clout, let's talk about fab, but the amount of leverage that you as a seed investor have is de minimis at that it's point. It's always de minimis. It's, you know, and the, the question is whether you want to be a life cycle investor, investing through every round. Um, the reality is last money in mm -hmm. sets the terms. Yeah. Um, it's always the case. That being said, um, you know, just because a company becomes a unicorn, becomes mm -hmm. worth 250 million, a billion dollars, doesn't mean that it's going to be a successful business. Exactly. And um, but we're forced to mark to market. We mm -hmm. call it mark to myth. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because it's kind of like it's whatever. But yeah. you know, the re there's only two numbers that are important: I, I, the price you pay no, but listen, and the price you actually. Yeah, I agree. And you I'm know. not saying there's anything wrong with mark to market. What I'm suggesting is, as an investor, you know, look, 
I, I accept the idea that it's really the entrepreneur's decision. I accept that. And if the entrepreneur believes that, that raising 50 million is going to enable them to build a multi-billion dollar company as the, as the investor, as a board member, I certainly will have a vigorous debate about whether we're ready, but I'm not in the blocking entrepreneurs from doing what they want to do. But what I would say is this, because as a board member, as an early stage investor, you do have a lot of influence. And at a minimum, I want them to think hard about the consequences. And we have been involved with many companies that could have gone and taken really quick, big rounds. And we're usually circumspect about doing that. I think it's just, it, it changes the dimension of the business very early and it limits your outcomes and your opportunities. Agreed. Um, so something else you said you're interested in, you invested uh, in Cornerstone On Demand, congratulations. You did Indiegogo, congratulations. You did Clout, which for you as an early stage investor, congratulations, sold for 200 million to Lithium. Uh, you're also interested in the drone business. You invested in Skycatch, yes, which I think is Christian Sands' business. Christian yeah. Sands, yeah. yeah. So we invested- Who I think is marvelous. I really like him. Uh, he's, done, he's done great. Um, we invested two years ago in Skycatch. And for those, you know, it's classed as a drone company. Mm -hmm. It's really a, an, an aerial mapping company. Okay. You know, the, the, it's a very simple business model. They use autonomous drones, so no mm -hmm. one with a joystick, mm -hmm. to go and capture information, mm -hmm. uh, hours of video and photographs. They then build very detailed, high-definition maps, say, of a construction site. Right. They build three-dimensional models of that, and then they apply AI to find things you'd want to find. Mm -hmm. So if you're building some of these really large buildings that are out there, um, there are hundreds of people involved with the construction company. Mm -hmm. And people can sit in the main office and not come out and look at the site. Right. You can overlay the 3D CAD drawings of a site with what's being built and call out things that are out of compliance. You can run heat maps to see where activity is. If you've got 160 construct, um, um, uh, lorries full of cement, you need to stage them somewhere, get access, and where For they need to go to. For anyone not English, he was referring to trucks. Oh, trucks, trucks. yes, trucks. Um, you put your pram on your lorry, <laughs> and you smoke a fag, right? Let's not go yeah. there. So, um, so there's a lot of things that they can do. In fact, um, Skycatch, uh, well, Bechtel, um, very large construction company recently got FAA clearance to use Skycatch drones okay. on their sites in the US. Komatsu has announced uh, a very expansive um, uh, deal with Skycatch. And this company has grown to, in two years yeah. from nothing to 60 plus employees. Yeah. Come on, leaving. There's a ton companies. of drone companies. What do you think differentiates Skycatch? Um, I think it was the unique understanding of. Um, Autonomous drones, uh, data visualization, and AI combined mm -hmm. in one product. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's a services business, it's really a SaaS platform that uses drones. The, the thing that intrigues me about drones mm -hmm. is I think it's such an underhyped space. Underhyped? Yes. I think however big people How could think it be drones. Underhyped, it seems like one of those topics like Bitcoin everyone wants to talk about. I feel that there's a ton more capital going to space. Mm -hmm. I think there's enormous utility. Any way we think about the space, we see more and more opportunity. Um, whether they're high payload, low payload, low altitude, high altitude. It's building an information layer that hasn't existed before that can save billions of dollars across mining, construction, retail, et cetera, et cetera. So There's also tremendous negative externalities, though, that have to be addressed, such as interference with commercial airlines, which we've already seen, uh, ability to fly in places you shouldn't be flying, like the White House, which we've already seen, ability to put cameras on them and filming people in their backyards, which you know, raises privacy concerns. I'm not negative on drones. No, 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 no. But we, as, but you, we but as a society can, have, have we got have to address. had the same conversation yeah. talking about any big innovative piece of technology, including mm -hmm. the internet itself. Where mm -hmm. How can you let people just communicate? How can you allow social networks to happen where people communicate? You put all this together, those will but, be... But to be fair... I'm going to tell you, yeah. those will be solved. Yeah. 
and there will be a lot of asymmetrical risk. Mm -hmm. You know, drones flying into the White House, mm -hmm. kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. Those problems will end up being solved, but mm -hmm. the space itself will be enormous. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I tell you, just I look at the world today, and we were having this conversation before. I think most people listening to this, watching this uh, video cast, mm -hmm. um, spend on average 30% of their waking time on Netflix, on Hulu Plus, on a smartphone, playing video games, on their Xbox, mm -hmm. um, on Facebook, on Twitter, things they didn't do 10 years ago. Well, and to be fair, they did them, they just did them using different media. But it wasn't, I'm saying 30% of their time that mm -hmm. they spend today, mm -hmm. they didn't spend it on that. They were doing other things. They were mm -hmm. watching more television. Mm -hmm. They weren't watching YouTube. They right. were um, reading these are, newspapers. These, these are replacements for other right. activities that they were doing, but using but totally some new technology. Some replacements, yeah. some are new activities. Um, the ability for the phone to be your front door key is mm -hmm. a new activity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think over the next 10 to 20 years, the mm -hmm. world is going to be unrecognizable to us in similar ways. I think drones will be a big part of that. Gotcha. I, I'm not negative about drones. I just think that there's enough negative externalities that the adoption. Uh, so if, if I agree on the 20 year plan, yeah. I think the next few years are going to hit a bunch of bumps from a regulatory and societal perspective. Just like, I mean, I was concerned about us using drones in. Pakistan and Afghanistan, not because I didn't think it was necessarily a good idea, right. but because the minute you open up the defense use case for drones, you're opening up foreign governments to be it's, able to use drones uh, in the exact same way, right? right. So, of course, we use the term drone in two different types of... That's a, an application of a drone, right? right? I, I, I recognize yeah, yeah, you're talking about yeah. smaller drones used for different purposes. Right. Um, but I, I'm, 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 I'm in an agreement that drones as a category will be with us for a long time. Uh, I just think that they're sufficiently hyped rather than underhyped. hyped <laughs> sufficiently hyped, how about? Um, and one of the areas that you feel is overhyped is self-driving cars as a category. Am I right or am I wrong about well, that? Well, I don't think it's overhyped. Um, it's clear from the media and everything I read that government regulation is moving fast than I would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. but. I am deeply concerned about the notion of being in a self-driving car mm -hmm. that knows it's going to get into an accident. Mm -hmm. And it can drive off the cliff and kill me. Mm -hmm. It can drive into the car ahead of us and kill mm -hmm. that family. Mm -hmm. Or it can drive into this, these children on the, on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And it has an algorithm to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And do I want that algorithm? to be pre-factored by the manufacturer of a car who may factor in their liability mm -hmm. against all of this. That worries me. Yeah, but at the same, and, the same point in time, I mean, for me, if you're gonna argue in favor of drones, knowing that there's consequences of drones, it's pretty tough to take the opposite side of that debate with self-driving cars. I mean, here's the thing, we know, we know that technology that exists today, let alone what exists in 10 years from today, for self-driving cars is safer than a human being. We know that already. And so if we can, pr and, and, and the other thing about like self-driving cars, you think about like, you take this huge asset, call it a $30,000 asset that has huge negative externalities in terms of manufacturing uh, and you know, pollution and everything else that goes with it. And we use it one hour a day at maximum. If you could take cars that become shared resources and become autonomous and I leave and they drive off and pick up the next person, um, we could massively reduce the number of cars that are on the road, massively reduce uh, uh, the amount of carbon emissions and the amount of fossil fuels that we're using. There's no, que there's no question, no question we're heading into a world with self-driving There's no question uh, autonomous going, cars. No question we're going there. I'm concerned about the legalities. Yeah, but all but, these but, things but, will but, be but, solved but, in but, the same way. But, uh, but there's, there's a slight sort of fault in your argument, which is if you have l less cars. Mm -hmm. Fewer cars, yeah. Fewer cars. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm the grammar police. <laughs> <laughs> if you have fewer cars, um, 
doesn't mean that you use less fossil fuels or you use because all you're doing is higher utilization. Yeah. And what concerns me, to be quite honest, you take utilization from 4% to 10%, the number of cars sold in this country dropped from a season adjusted rate of 16 million a year mm -hmm. to 6 million a year. 10% mm -hmm. of US manufacturing gets crushed. And so just like most businesses we invest in, yeah. most businesses you invest in, it's incredibly deflationary. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I look around and when I stand back and look at the macroeconomic view, I think we're going through a period, a multi-decade period of deflation. Mm -hmm. I don't see interest rates ever going up. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's way too much debt in the system. I think we're creating um, uh, structural unemployment that will have to be resolved. I'm, I don't want to be seduced by the Luddite argument, mm -hmm. but it is a very seductive argument. Um, and I think the world is going to look dramatically, dramatically different. And there will be a lot of robots, drones, self-driving cars. It's the world in, we're in heading into. It's the world we're heading into. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I... But, and it comes with a lot of risks. Yeah, but, but listen, it's the same thing that people... I mean, not to be Pollyannish or whatever, but it's the same argument that people used a hundred years ago about what are all these people who are putting hooves on, on horses going to do? And what about the carriage makers who make carriages I don't, for horses? I, I, listen, I don't disagree. Yeah. You and I know the app economy yeah. is as big now as the U.S. box office, mm -hmm. and it didn't exist eight years ago. Yeah. So there definitely will be new businesses, but I'll tell you that it is fundamentally deflationary because we're investing in companies I, I that agree. are more efficient yeah, I agree. Or, or doing new things that bring efficiency to business. Ultimately, what technology does, mm -hmm. it enables people to do more interesting things. Sure. So your argument would be we'll have more leisure time in the future. You know, it's funny. I remember seeing in the UK, we had this thing called Panorama, which is a bit like 60 Minutes, I know except, Panorama. It, except it actually yeah. ran for 60 Minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they had this thing, the and Factory of the Future. In 2000, reporting. so yeah. in 1980, I watched this. In 2000, yeah. the Factory of the Future will have two employees who'll play, you know, ping pong or table tennis yeah. um, all day, and they'll just need to fix the machines when there's a problem. Yeah, no, I, I, there may be more leisure. Maybe we have that now. Maybe that's what Facebook is and watching YouTube and you know, being on Snapchat. That's, time. We're just slotting it in with Tell everything else. Tell me about women. We've just come off the trial of the century in our industry, Ellen Powell, and I right. won't ask you to comment on the actual case. But I read data suggesting that 4% of all partners in VC firms are women. Right. And let's just exaggerate and call it 8 to 10%. I think because, that would be an exaggeration. Well, okay, so we'll stick with 4%. I don't have the actual data in front of right. me, but I remember reading that. That's abysmal. And I'm trying to get my head around why it is and what can be done about it. I mean, if I simply put it this way, the people who invest in us, LPs, and I went through four years of meeting every LP that right. I could in the industry, um, have a significantly better gender balance, even at the part lo partner level of the decisions of which VCs to invest. And it wasn't like I went to see a bunch of LPs and 96% of them were men. They weren't. So you can't tell me that investor class, somehow men have better or different skills. So what, what is it, do you think, in our industry? What do we need to change? Well, uh, look, I, or do you not accept the premise that we need to change? Well... Need is a strong term. I think we will change. Mm -hmm. I think we'll change just because of the nature of, um, of uh, all of the things that end up feeding who partners at venture firms end up being. But, I mean, I don't know about you, but there aren't a lot of strong female candidates out there. Mm -hmm. And... The ones who are out there are in massive demand. Mm -hmm. So why is it that that's the case? And let's go and have a look. Where do most VC partners come from? Some come from finance. Uh, most of them come as entrepreneurs. So let me ask you a question. Today, are there more female founders that you see today than you saw 10 years ago? Yes. So the pipeline is getting broader. And so it's just going to work its way through. 
Yeah, but there must still be. Um, if you, you know, saw we, a great candidate, yeah. and, or we saw a great candidate, and it was a woman, yeah, and not a man, mm -hmm. well, great. Yeah, I don't, right? I don't, I, mean, I don't, I don't question that. But you know, but yeah. but but we as an industry have. I mean, it's not it's not fair to say there aren't enough great candidates. It depends on what the background you're looking for in a candidate is. If you classify it as I must get CEOs of tech businesses and that's what I'm looking to hire, of course there's fewer women. Yeah, but that, but, that, but you don't do that I and mean, we don't do that. You're saying, is this an incredibly talented person I can bring on board, right? It could be someone you meet tonight at mm -hmm. dinner. It could be wherever. You come across talented people that you think, um, but if you look at the top this? firms in Silicon Valley, I, and I, I can't, can't, I can't say each one, but a lot of the top firms don't have a single female partner. I'm going to tell you, you and I would have on a private conversation a lot yeah. of criticisms of yeah. other firms and how they're structured and what they get up to, and this would be part of it. But it's 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 really not for us to comment on how other people run their businesses. It's, sure it it's is. A matter of, sure no, it is. We're, no, we're, a, we're in an industry where we can comment, I think, on the behavior of our peer group. We've already done it the, I entire, to, I the to, entire hour. I prefer to lead by example. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think you do as well. Mm -hmm. I think you have very strongly stated By, by the way, I'm not calling out any named individual firm, but we as an industry have to do more. Today is female equality pay. I don't know what their official term for it is. Women equal pay day. Right. I don't know if you knew that. I, no. uh, I saw it on Twitter. That's the wonderful thing about Twitter, right? <laughs> like I didn't wake up knowing that. Just like I didn't know it was sibling day whenever it was sibling day. <laughs> sibling day is made up. I mean, like when did sibling day get started? I really, I heard about it yesterday. I Do mean, you have siblings? I, I have two siblings. Yeah, I only found out about sibling day because one of my siblings posted on Facebook and then I felt guilty. I think it's created by Hallmark, you know, as a way to drive Hallmark up card sales. Yeah, or, or maybe by Facebook. Facebook, the starter rumor, I think Facebook created Sibling Day. To Facebook get more, created Sibling more Day. Engagement. But, but so on, on Twitter today, I saw it was Equal Pay Day for women. One day they'll and, make up something like Mother's Day. Yeah. Women are paid, on average, 70%. On average, 70% of what men are paid but, in but America. You, look, look, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Mm -hmm. So let you me You don't ask, believe that stat is right? I, I'm not saying the stat is wrong, mm -hmm. but is that comparable people in comparable professions for comparable work done? Or is it all women and all men and the different professions well, you tell involved me, in? Have I you don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked at the data. I suspect that the data would suggest that women are paid less for the same jobs. Does that happen in your firm? It doesn't happen in our firm. Doesn't happen in our firm. Uh, I suspect it doesn't happen in our industry as much as it happens in other industries. Yeah. I may be wrong about that, but the only reason I would say that is, well, in part, we have an endemic problem in our industry, which is the overwhelming majority of programmers and product people are men. That's already a problem. Uh, I don't know if it's a problem that we're qualified to solve, but that's already a problem. Um, but, you know, I do think, like if I look, I'll just give you one example, is Sheryl Sandberg, and I'm not saying she was paid less, but for the role that she played at Facebook, it took way too long for her to be put on the board of Facebook. I think that was wrong. And so I guess I think that as men, we have a responsibility not to change everyone else's business, but to highlight issues and to make sure people are thinking about them. Yeah, and I think, I think people are doing that, and people are thinking about it. But, you know, I, I got to tell you that I think it will change. I think that there's just a natural propensity to do it. The more women who find engineering interesting will do it. I have five children mm -hmm. and, you know, one of my daughters is really into programming. Okay. And that's great. And I how want many, to encourage How many are boys? How many are girls? Uh, three boys, two girls. Okay. You know, one, 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 of my, uh, one of my boys tried programming just hated it right so you know it all depends you know everyone has different skills right and you know as far as I'm concerned I'm much more about the quality of opportunity than the mm -hmm. quality of outcome right if everyone has the same opportunity the outcomes will sort out themselves but trying to mandate a quality of outcome I'm not saying mandate <laughs> I didn't say mandate uh, although I do think we have to be careful to make sure that 
you don't have institutional bias that pay certain groups less. I do think I we, we need oversight uh, at least to make sure that there's a fair playing field, but I'm not talking about mandating. What I'm talking about is educating. And the hardest thing as a man to do is to speak up on women's issues because I'm not a woman, right? But I think saying nothing equally is wrong. So uh, we'll move on to a different topic, uh, open versus closed networks. Right. Um, Chris Dixon, uh, in the course of the last two or three days, did a tweet storm. Right. I wish Twitter would create a fucking product to allow this to happen. I mean, By the way, people take pictures of yeah. text and then yeah. post it up on Twitter. I'm like, that tells you there's something wrong. Right? That tells you something wrong with, with Twitter and mm. with this product. It needs to find a way to accommodate. It is getting better. Like, the fact that I can now retweet someone or quote the tweet quote retweets look and, really good. and be able to show in line yeah. the series of what was said and what I said, and they're getting much better. Um, but of course they haven't solved uh, the tweet storm issue. Mm -hmm. But so Chris went through a series of uh, tweets on how networks have increasingly gotten more closed. We've already talked about some of them. Yes. We know Facebook started as somewhat of an open network encouraging developers to develop like Zynga, like Rocky, like Slide, and over time curtailed and went more closed. Um, we know that Twitter Twitter, Twitter did the same, but they closed more aggressively. Um, Twitter was a completely open environment mm. and now is completely closed. I can't imagine being a developer wanting to develop on Twitter right now. It's just, uh, I, I would find it surprising if anyone was pitching me a business to do that because it's very clear that they don't value third party developers. Um, so that's Twitter and Facebook, but Apple also a very closed ecosystem. They're not promoting. So, I mean, hard to fault Twitter and not fault the entire industry. The entire right. industry is moving in that direction. But Chris said that he thought these things go in cycles and that he thought closed would eventually go back to open and open would. And I, I know you don't totally agree, but I tend to agree with Chris, which is I think the competitive dynamics, if I take Google, okay, what made Google so powerful initially was they created a search page that immediately drove everyone to a third party site. So in a way it was the ultimate form of being open. They, they weren't trying to control everything on Google. It was all just about, you know, and in a way that's what Twitter was. It was like this open platform click right. and link out to anyone. Over time, Twitter wants more and more of your time spent in twitter.com just, or, or the app, just like Google wants to control that you don't click out and go to other websites. But there will be the next great Google that comes along that builds its source of differentiation being a referral source for traffic. And for at least a time, I think the pendulum will become more open. Yes and no. Um, so yes, eventually, you know, eventually everything happens. But what I think we have now, we have Apple, we have Google, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have a, a dozen very large dominant players who are young enough to know that they're at risk from the next thing coming along. Yeah. So anything that looks like it could grow up and be a really important network is going to get purchased, it's going to get taken out. Yeah. I mean, that's what Facebook has aggressively done. People say, like, how can they pay so much money for that? Mm -hmm. This is why they're doing it. And, you know, and then you get other situations where, you know, um, you know, Meerkat isn't given enough time to go and develop into being a powerful platform on the back of Twitter. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. But, but fundamentally, I think the giants are not as sleepy as they were 10 years ago. I think right. Microsoft, you know, they laughed at the iPhone. They, 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 they didn't get the internet. Right. They, they, they were just very stuck in their world because they had deep cash cow businesses. I think a lot of the businesses that are driving these companies are new. I mean, look at Apple with, you know, the iPad, which is being cannibalized, you know. Are you long Apple Watch? Do you have a view on Apple Watch? I, I'm perplexed by the Apple Watch. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, if it ends up being a big business, mm -hmm. it's a bit like when the iPod first came out, right. which took three years to really, or three generations to really go mainstream. 
I think the amount of health data um, and personal data can be very significant. The notification stuff, I'm not sure if it's annoying or helpful. The battery life at this stage is, to me, a really restrictive factor. Mm -hmm. um, and, but they're doing something interesting to mm -hmm. get for the same piece of electronics for people to pay between three, four hundred dollars and seventeen thousand thousand dollars. I think it's kind of amazing. Um, and you know, it's a, it's overnight. It's a new multi-billion-dollar business that didn't exist. There'll be an ecosystem built around it. Apps have to be built for the screens, etc. Um, so I'm fascinated by it, but I'm watching it from the sidelines. So it's interesting because we're on the cusp of them releasing, and yet many people probably watch this video a year from now after right. it's been released and say how stupid we were. But uh, what people have told me who are on the inside at Apple, because, uh, you know, I, I have some skepticism. Right. Uh, I'm not skeptical about the category, but I'm skeptical whether I would be a prolific user. What they said is, for the people who always feel the need to get out their device and constantly be checking and pulling your phone out or whatever, and it, it creates an interference with your everyday life, they said they were surprised at how seamless Apple Watch made tech in your everyday life. So if I give you the example, what fascinated me about Google Glass, and I never owned one and I always thought they were geeky, but um, was the idea that sometimes I don't live in the moment. And it's not because of phones and texting. For me, it's photography. When my son has a birthday party and it's his, let's say his 12th birthday party, and I want to capture that moment for posterity. I'm torn between my role of the capture of posterity right. and my role as a father wanting to enjoy and experience it. Right. And the idea of Google Glass was I get to wear a glass and I get to say camera on and I'm actually experiencing the event and ph photographing it becomes a byproduct. So with that backdrop in mind, that's the idea that people are telling me, it's like I can be in a meeting, I don't, I'm not taking out my phone, there's no interference, I see a notification, I swipe, and they're saying it's becoming a more seamless experience. Now, I almost never use my phone in the day, really, almost never, but that's the nature of my job. Like you, I sit in meetings all day and it would be rude to take my phone out all day. There must be people that are constantly interrupted by their phone and maybe a watch will be a solution for that. I don't know, yeah. time, time will tell. Here's what I'll tell you. When IBM first came up with a computer, mm -hmm. they said there'll be a demand for five or six computers in the world. It was Digital who said that. It was, it was the founder of Digital who said that. Founder of Digital who said that. And then we had a computer in every business. Mm -hmm. Then we had most employees have a computer. And then we had most homes have a computer. Then most people in most homes have a computer. And then we had a computer in everyone's pocket. Right. And now we're putting a computer on everyone's wrist. And then there'll be, there's going to be chips in everything. Right. You know, you're going to come into a room like this and there'll be 20 computers. Of course. And they'll be doing different things. And they'll, they'll be integrated in a way that you're willing to open up your privacy without you feeling you've lost something. Mm -hmm. And you'll walk into the room and it'll do the right thing. So when you walk up from this meeting, it will know as you walk out the room to order an Uber for you so that when you get downstairs, the Uber will be there and, they know, and it knows where it's going to take you. It's going to feel like magic. Mm -hmm. But that's the world that we're going to create because we're going to build this information layer around us that will predict everything mm -hmm. we want to be able and to And how do watches fit into that? It's just, I'm going to look just, at my wrist and it'll know that I'm running it's late. It's the next stage. Okay. It's, the next, it's, it's just the next stage. And... You know, there'll be embedded chips along the way. Um, so I think it's inevitable that we get more and more personal mm -hmm. with uh, technology. Um, but it bemuses me. You know, I've seen them in the Apple store. I'm just not sure if I would want to wear one. Or Are you an early adopter? You wouldn't. I am predominantly an early adopter, and I'm an Apple ecosystem adopter. Um, and I'm perplexed by it. Yeah. I'm just waiting for them to ship an Apple TV that actually works. That's my... <laughs> <laughs> They're shipping it this year. I think end of the year, they say. 
That'll be cool. Yeah, their current one sucks. That'll be cool. Um, look, I got to wrap. Wanted to say thank you for being my most prolific guest. This is your <laughs> third you. appearance. It's always wonderful to catch up with you. Always a great opportunity for me to learn about what's going on in your world. So I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me.